Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. On this week's episode, we have Coach Mike Burns from the Tilton School join us. And Mike is unique because Mike did a postgrad year himself at Fork Union before playing at St. Francis PA. And then from there, he transferred to UMass Amherst, where he played for John Calipari when he was just starting out as a head coach. Um, he's also coached at Hargrave, Winchenden, um, some other, uh, other schools' assistants. He's been a D1 assistant at Robert Morris before becoming a head coach at the D3 school, Rhode Island College. So we talk about all types of things, his prep school experience, uh, coaching at different levels in college, and then turning two prep schools into prep school powerhouses and kind of some other things uh, along that line, as well as what's it take to be a D1 player since he's coached at that level and sent kids to that level in the past. So with that being said, Let's welcome Coach Mike Burns of the Tilton School to the Prep Athletics Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Mike, welcome to the show. Corey, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. After graduating high school, you actually chose to do a post-grad year at Fork Union. Um, back in those days, prep schools weren't widely known across the country. So how did you know about a post-grad year, and why did you pick Fork Union? Growing up in the New England area, obviously you had small inclinations about prep schools, Worcester Academy, um, New Hampton. So there were some schools you had heard of, but again, they weren't very prevalent. Um, luckily for me, my family were willing to make the sacrifice because it was go to a junior college, firm junior college, where my uncle had gone to school, went down there, visited, liked it, but I, my grades were fine, so I really didn't need it. Um, so my parents started looking around at different prep schools, and I'll never forget the day. My grandfather was a swimmer at Holy Cross, so he invited me to go to a Holy Cross Maryland basketball game. I was standing in the hallway after the basketball game and Sherman Dillard, who was assistant at Maryland at the time, was walking past me and my dad. I'm six, seven, stood out a little bit and he asked me who I was, what I was doing. And I told him that I was probably going to go to a prep school. And I mentioned a few of the prep schools and he called over Lefty Dizelle. He introduced me to Lefty Dizelle, same thing, asked you the questions. And he said, have you ever heard of Fork Union Military Academy? And I said, no, I have not. My father was a Marine, so obviously the ring of military was good for him. Maybe not for me, but they recommended they go down and uh, visit. So we drove down. I'll never forget it. Drove to the night, got there at about 2 in the morning. I was so excited. I wanted to see it, so instead of checking in the hotel, we drove around the campus. Very, very eerie feeling driving around a military campus with no one anywhere, no lights on. Uh, so a little bit overwhelmed, a little nervous. The next day, I uh, met Coach Jarrett, took a tour of campus, and I had the opportunity to work out with the guys in the team. And the team that he had that year, there were over 10 Division I guys on the team. So I worked out with the guys, must have played well enough. I won't lie to you, I was very, very nervous, had a stomachache, was not feeling well, played the best I possibly could, sat down with Coach Jarrett, Hall of Fame coach, obviously legendary prep school coach, um, and I had it between Fork Union and uh, Tom Blackburn at Worcester Academy. And I was just so impressed with the campus and the fact that they had 10 Division One guys on the team. And that was my aspiration. Uh, my family was able to work it out financially. They thought it was worth the investment. So we chose Fork Union Military Academy. And what did you gain from that year, Mike? I learned what hard work was. Uh, I thought I was a hard worker. Um, I thought I was a determined student athlete, but after going there and realizing what it took to be a college athlete, uh, the rigmarole of getting up early in the morning. I mean, as you know, you went to a military school. I had a rifle. I had a military uniform. Uh, they had white gloves and went under my bed to make sure my room was clean. Just complete clarity in how important this adventure was for me and how hard I had to work and how much time and effort I had to put into it if I wanted to be a college athlete. And we had some great guys in the team, Miami, Virginia Tech, North Carolina, Charlotte, West Virginia. I mean, we were loaded. Um, and I had to find my role. I obviously was not a starter. I was, you know, a guy that came off the bench and 
I thought I was a great shooter. I thought I was a very good player, but I realized I couldn't guard anybody, didn't move well laterally, didn't run very fast, that the only way I was going to be successful was to outwork people. And playing from Coach Arrett, going through that, I learned that and I had the opportunity to play Division One basketball. Yeah, and you played at UMass. Tell me about that decision. Like, why did you pick UMass and what other schools were kind of in the mix uh, before you chose them? Well, to be honest with you, it wasn't UMass right off the bat. Um, I visited Rutgers, one of my teammates in Fork Unit, my position, visited for I did, committed, so that didn't work out. Then we went into the springtime with a lot of the kids are right now. I still didn't know where I was going to go to school. In hindsight, I should not have said no to Stonehill and Bentley, who drove all the way down and offered me a scholarship. Basketball-wise, I probably should have went to one of those two schools. I did not. So it was literally down to St. Francis, PA, and VMI. Mm. And I had had enough fun with VMI. I did not want to do any more military. So my freshman year, I went to St. Francis, PA. I did that my freshman year. And it was just not what I was looking for. Didn't really have the major. Didn't really fit in with the chemistry on the team. Being a Massachusetts kid, I called Coach Arrett and I asked him for help if I could find me another school. And Coach Gerlison was a coach uh, at that time. Uh, his son just got the job at San Francisco, but he was a coach. And they had three players on the team from Fork Union. So me being a Massachusetts kid, he offered me a scholarship. So I ended up transferring to UMass, and then I was fortunate enough that the spring of my sophomore year, Cal Perry took the job, so I had the opportunity to play with Coach Cal, his first year as a Division I head coach, my junior year, my senior year. Oh, we'll get to that in a second, but you did transferring before it was Nouveau, right? So you did it back in the day. Yeah, um, it was, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't like my role in the team. We had a bunch of junior college kids. Um, it was just a different type of roster that I didn't feel comfortable with. I was a, you know, an Irish Catholic kid from the Boston area. And it was just a culture shock as of some of the kids that were on the roster. I just didn't really fit in. I didn't like my role in the team. I wanted to get back closer to home. Wanted a bigger school. St. Francis PA was a really, really small school. Isolated up on a mountain. Um, it snowed every single day. Um, and I just wanted to find a new, a new start. And I was very fortunate to get to UMass. Yeah, and your, but your transfer was a pure upgrade. I mean, that's, uh, that doesn't always happen for kids. Correct. Well, UMass wasn't very good when I made the transfer. I mean, we had talented kids. It wasn't, you know, we were, they were down at that time. So we weren't great at that time. Obviously, the first meeting I had with Coach Cal, you realize we would be great really, really quick. Um, but when I made the transfer, yes, I guess it was up in class. It was a Yankee conference at that time. Um, but we weren't really, really good at that time. This was Cal's first time as a head coach, correct? Yeah, Cal had come from this. He was an assistant at Pittsburgh when he got the job. So, yes, it was his first year as a head coach. Uh, playing for Calipari, what did you learn from him his first two years as a head coach? First meeting when he came in and talked to us, you could just tell it was a different vibe. You knew he had a vision. You knew he knew what he was doing. Uh, I didn't know if I really fit into the plans, um, like I, I always jokingly say, I was probably the worst player that's ever played with John Calipari. He was more or less stuck with me, but how he took care of his player, how they coached us. I mean, to be honest with you, I was enjoying UMass probably you know, more than I really should have. Calipari sat me and my father down and he made me sign an academic contract saying that if I didn't get over a 2.75, um, that he would take my scholarship away, or at least that's what he led me to believe. Um, he got all of us our own personal tutors. I had some learning disabilities, so I needed my own personal tutor. Um, so he really cared about us as what he, people always talk about. He always talks about caring about his kids. I was not one of his players, but he wanted to make sure I got out of college what I should be getting out of it. Not only the basketball experience, but more important, the academic piece. And I got my four semesters with Cal were my four best academic semesters. So you could tell he knew what he was doing. And then when he started bringing kids in on visits, they were just different kids that were on our roster. He mm. just knew that he was going to bring in really, really good players. Gotcha. And now look what he's done. He's, he's come a long way. Yeah, and he has not coached anybody as bad as me ever again. <laughs> I think. You can ask him, he'll probably tell you. Yeah, that's a good moniker to have. Yeah. Um, so we're talking now in May of 2022, you're finishing up your first season 
as a head coach at the Tilton School. Um, when you talk to families about playing for you and coming to Tilton, what's your pitch? Well, first off, the school's been here forever and it's had a tremendous amount of success. When I wanted to get back into prep schools, I wanted to find a school that I felt comfortable selling. My father was in sales and he never worked for a company if he didn't want to buy the product. So when I had other opportunities to get back into prep schools, it just to me wasn't a good fit. So when this job opened up, I knew Marcus O'Neill for years. I competed against him. Um, so I knew the school. I'd been on the campus. So when this opportunity showed itself, it was a no-brainer for me. Um, my sales pitch is one, the school. Like when kids walk around this campus, when they come on their visits, I want them to feel comfortable walking through the hallways, meeting other, other kids on this campus that are like you. Same thing when I tell my kids when they go on a college visit, that when they sit in a classroom, they look around. When they go to the cafeteria, they look around and talk to people. Do they feel comfortable on the campus? So first half, they have to feel comfortable with it. And as far as the basketball part of it, fortunately for me, a parent, and a kid can never look at me and say, Coach Burns, you don't know what you're talking about. Because just like we discussed, I did it as a player. Obviously, I've been a prep school coach going on 20 years as an assistant, as a head coach. I helped start Hargrave Military Academy as well. So I've done it for 20 years. I've been a college head coach for four years. I've been a Division One assistant coach for five years. I played for John Calipari. I played for Fletcher Aaron. So my database uh, my toolbox is really, really strong. I have contacts with all those coaches over the years. So I can look parents and kids in the eyes and tell them that I'm going to give you 100% effort. If you want to get to where you belong, because I can't tell if a kid wants to go to North Carolina, I can't get him there. He's not good enough to get there. But if a kid wants to play for a coach and go to a school that's going to get them ready to be a college athlete, I feel very comfortable saying that I'm right up there with the Mount Rushmore's of coaches that can help get those kids and their families what they're looking for. I mean, that's what's so great about you, Mike, is doing a post-grad year, right? Especially in the military ones. It's a little bit tougher to do that than, you know, a normal New England prep school. Uh, playing D1, transferring, D3, D1, starting prep programs, having prep, prep powerhouses. Like, you've done so much that you've got connections at every level now, which is very valuable. So let me ask you this. If you're going head to head with another school and the other prep school has a younger coach who's maybe more in line with, with the younger players of today, you know, what do you say to a kid that's like, well, this coach kind of gets me, he can get out and run up and down with us in the court. Would you say your experience trumps that if you're talking well, about another school I mean, with a younger coach? If you talk to friends in the business, between the lines, yes, I am very, very structured. Obviously, I have that military background, um, but I believe that I have the humor and the sarcasm outside the lines, and I try to bring it between the lines as well. And when I talk to kids in person, when I talk to kids on the phone, I'm very young at heart. I am out on the floor with them. I won't lie to you. It's probably not a smart idea for me to get in many drills anymore. Um, you know, I used to love taking a charge on the guys called the gut check drill when I'd stand there and take a charge and, and I'd run into them and they'd take a charge of me. And I said, if you, you could take a charge of me, you could take a charge of anybody. I probably can't do that anymore. Again, obviously some kids may feel comfortable with a younger coach, but again, you're only young at heart. I mean, I'm yeah. not, I'm not coaching in a wheelchair. I don't have a cane. Um, my personality, the energy level that I have, I'll match up against any coach. And as I said, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I have a lot of tools in my toolbox. Um, I can't make myself younger. I would. I'm sure my wife would like that as well. Um, I am what I am, but I do believe I'm very young at heart. And hopefully talking to kids on the phone, meeting them in person, they get that same read as well. Yeah, absolutely. Great answer. Um, I'm going to ask you a question I ask every single coach that comes on here. And you being a former D1 assistant um, is going to help me with this. What does it take for a guard to play at the D1 level? Because remember, every guard you and I talk to wants to, you know, pretty much cross the board do that. So what's your advice? Well, yeah, well first off, they have to be a Division I athlete. Like, like you have to be an athletic kid. If you don't move well laterally and you can't keep your man in front of you, then you're probably not going to be a Division I kid. Whereas – 
like myself, I knew I was a phenomenal shooter. I watched Larry Bird as a kid. That was my number. I thought I shot the ball as well as Larry Bird, but I wasn't six foot nine and I wasn't as skilled as he was. Um, so these kids say they're great shooters, but again, when you get to the next level, those guys that are guarding you are so much more athletic and so much quicker and a lot of times taller, you know, like watch watching the Celtics play last night. The reason why they're so competitive is they can switch one through five. They're just so good at all those different positions. Kids can work on ball handling. Kids can get themselves as strong as humanly possible. Kids can work on their three-point shot. But if you can't keep your guy in front of you, you're going to struggle getting a Division I scholarship. So probably the athleticism and the size to be able to compete against those guys night in, night out. Interesting. So when you were at Robert Morris, did you guys have smaller guards? I guess you did. They just were very athletic then, right? Strong, yeah, they, they, they still, they were smaller. And again, we were in the NEC. They were thicker or they were tougher okay. or they did something really, really well. They passed the ball really well, shot it really, really well. But when I was at Ron Morris, we just got the toughest kids humanly possible. Our kids were New Jersey kids, Philadelphia kids. And not that, not that there aren't tougher kids elsewhere, but New York City guards, Philly guards, you know, Newark kids, it just, they're just a tougher brand of kids that will rip your face off, you know, to get a loose ball or to make that one big play. Uh, and not that other kids won't, but we try to recruit a toughness that we may not, may not, we have got it at a higher level. You know, they may be looking for someone tall. We just had to get the toughest kids humanly possible. When you're recruiting, can you tell a tough kid just watching a game? Can you tell that pretty quick? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I see if they take a charge. I see if they die for a loose ball. When the ball goes up in the air, are they afraid to put their noses in places that, that it's going to get hurt? Are they willing to make that, you know, make that toughness play that I might, may break my nail right here, dive for this loose ball? There's a possibility that I'm going to get bruised if I don't, if I go for this loose ball. Yes, I can definitely see what a tough kid is. And, and that's the thing with me in practice. If my guys aren't tough or don't make a tough play, I'll call them out and I'll tell them that's just not tough enough. Does this yeah, generation, yeah, does this generation have less tough kids, do you think, the current one? Um, I mean, probably. I mean, I mean, a lot of the kids, obviously, they change AAU teams. They change programs. If they don't like one thing, they get another thing. Kids transfer. There are 1,500 kids in transfer portal. Matter of fact, I was reading an article. Cal Perry was making some quotes that, like, he wants kids that are going to tough it out. Because a coach is not always going to give you what you want. You have to earn it. Right. And, and, and that's what's tough for me when we're recruiting, whereas there are some coaches in our league that may tell kids that they can shoot the ball every, every single time they can have it. They, they're going to start. Like Nothing in your life is giving. Everything is earned. I like to believe I've had kids that have started and played minutes for me that may not have been as talented as the kids that were on the bench, but the kids that played so hard and earned that time they were the ones that were going to get it. You have to reward those kids for that type of effort. Yeah, love it. I love it. All right, let's talk about your transition from being a D1 assistant coach to a D3 head coach. What were the main differences between the levels that you can share with kids? Because a lot of kids out there just say, I want to play D1 or eh, I don't know about D3. And I'm constantly trying to educate them on how good D3 basketball is. So since you've been in both worlds on the coaching side, tell me about that a little bit. Well, to be honest with you, I played against Amherst, played against East Connecticut, played against Keene State, played against Tufts. So we played against some very, very, very good teams um, that had Division I players on their team. A lot of the academic D3 kids or kids that maybe didn't get in Ivy League schools and they decided to go to Williams or Amherst to have that great education. Um, again, going back to the athletic piece, um, the difference in maybe division one and division three is they may not be athletic enough or maybe they're not tall enough. It's like a smaller version from D1 to D3, but the coaching and the ability levels and, 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 the, and the toughness and the competitiveness, it's, I mean, division three is all of it. And you see what happens in the NCAA tournament. Obviously it's high major, low major, but look what, I mean, look what St. Peter's did. 
Who would ever believe St. Peter's would have beaten Coach Cal? Coach Cal wouldn't have believed it. Um, who would ever believe you always see like a D3 team when they have their, their scrimmage, their D1 scrimmages early in the year? They, they beat them. Maybe they have teams that have been together for four years where D1 kids have transfers. They don't have that continuity. Uh, so, uh, yes, there is a big difference from Division One and Division Three. But I'm telling you, some of the most competitive games that I've seen have been on the Division Three level. Yeah, absolutely. What about uh, your transition from D1 assistant to D3 head coach? Was that a breath of fresh air because now you're in charge or was there more challenges that made it more difficult? Well, I mean, I wanted, I wanted to be a head coach again. And I wanted to be a head college coach again. Um, so when the opportunity showed itself to be a Division three head coach, to me it was to be a head coach. And I can remember when I called Coach Cal and I asked him for a recommendation. And he said, he goes, if you make this decision, if you leave D1, you're going to really have a tough time getting back to D1 again if you make this choice. But you got to remember, the most enjoyment I've got out of coaching has been at the prep school level. So I don't have a Division One mentality. I've never flown in jets. You know what I mean? I, I've never eaten at the highest level restaurants. I've always been been a prep school coach driving in a van and eating at McDonald's or bag lunches. So I really didn't have that mentality of having to be a division one head coach. And I tried the division one thing. Um, so when I had the opportunity to be a head college coach, it was an opportunity that I couldn't turn down. Well, tell me this, let's get into that. Why do you like prep school basketball more coaching it versus college level? Well, one of the finest questions I've, I've ever been asked is one of my former assistants who now at, he's a headmaster at a school uh, outside of Massachusetts. He asked me, what do I get most out of the game of basketball and in coaching? Is it winning championships? It's having kids go to the division one level. And, and, I, and it was a great question because I'm like, man, because at the end of the year, after we've won a championship, when I see people running around and, you know, going insane, like, that, that's not that, that's not why I get into this. The reason why I do this is the journey. It's to get that group the first day on campus and to learn them and to nurture them from where they are as to where they can go to. I enjoy the journey. And again, don't get me wrong. I want to win another NEPSAC championship, one three. I'd love to have my fourth, um, but I enjoy the journey. I, I love the journey of the team, the relationship of individually with the kids, relationship as a, as, as a group this year, obviously me getting the job after school started, we didn't win as many games um, as I would have liked to, we would have liked to, but we won three out of our last six. We beat some teams that we should have beaten and individually and collectively from the first game to the last game, that team came so far. Unfortunately, you're evaluating coaches by wins and losses. Whereas I can't say this is my best year ever coaching, but again, how far we came, I'm very proud of every individual in the whole group from where we started to where we went. So for me, I am a prep school coach. I can sell it. I know what kids need. I know what families need. Um, so it's the journey of it and the experience of where you start and where you go to. Yeah. And you kind of have two celebrations. You know, you're always trying to get kids. And when you finally get a kid to commit to you, that's a celebration right there. And then after the journey you just talked about, when they commit to a college, that's a second celebration there. So you kind of get both ends of it and see that progress. And when they move on in life and call you or you're friends with them on Facebook and you see them in coaching and you see them with their family and you run into them in a gym someplace and you go over and give them a hug and Coach Burns, you were crazy. You were so hard on us, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. You talked to us about life and how difficult life is, and, and you correlated in practice, and we didn't know what the heck you were talking about. You want to know what? You were right, and you helped get me there. That's the enjoyment. That's the stamp of approval that you're doing things the right way. That they could, they don't have to thank you, but just seeing them and then giving giving you that hug or seeing them be successful in the life, that's when you know that you've done a good job in your craft. Yeah, absolutely. Let me let me go back to D one a second since everyone's so intrigued with it. You know, what are the pros and what are the cons of either coaching or playing at D one based on your experiences? Well, I mean, playing D one and coaching D one. I mean, when, when I was at Robert Morris, we played at Rupp Arena. We were fortunate enough to have the opportunity to beat Coach Calipari in the NIT. 
but playing in those arenas that we played in, again, Rob Morris is a mid-major now, um, but just we played at Arkansas, we played at Arizona, uh, we played in these ridiculous Oklahoma states, you play in these ridiculous facilities, you stay in ridiculous hotels, you, know, you eat, you know, you, you eat the, the best steaks you could find, you're eating fillets, you're not eating chuck steak. Um, so it's a bit, bit different state of mind, the travel gear, the hotels, you know, I can remember when we played in the NIT, we were flying up to Providence and there was a charter plane sitting at the uh, Pittsburgh airport waiting for us and getting on this little charter plane. Well, that doesn't happen when you're a Division three coach. That doesn't happen when you're a prep school coach. Uh, and again, big, big time is state of mind. That's what everyone says. Um, but again, it, they are they are much much different levels of basketball. And that was me being on the mid-major level. I can't imagine how the UCLA and the UConn and the Duke and the Carolina, how those kids live and how they travel. It's just completely different. Um, but again, it's big time is what you, what you put into is what you get out of it. Yeah, what are the cons of D1? If you don't win, you lose your job. Yeah. <laughs> and then... If kids don't go to class and don't pass class and don't stay eligible, you lose your job. I'm an educator. I've been an educator my whole life. I've been in the classroom my whole life as a teacher. And I believe in ethics in the classroom. I believe kids have to go to class and they have to do the work and they have to earn the grades they get. And, it's, and, and it gets to the point when sometimes when you're on the division one level that, you know, there, there may be some kids that, may not be able to do the accelerated physics class that, the, that they're in. And it's, it's great that they're in college, um, but at the division one level, sometimes you get on the phone with a kid and you're trying to recruit the kid and you know, someone else is recruiting to say he's going to start and he's going to play 27 minutes a game and he's going to get 15 shots a game. And I'm very honest. I'm brutally honest with my kids. I tell them where I believe they can play, what they need to work on. If they're not going hard, I let them know. Unfortunately, sometimes the division one level, you as a coach, you sometimes say, do I have to go against my laurels and say to this kid, he's going to start or he's going to play all these minutes or he's going to play in the NBA or he's going to play in Europe when deep down, you know, he, that's not what's going to happen. So do you want to be honest to that kid or do you want to lie or fabricate it or walk a, a, a gray line uh, and tell the kids different? That, that was probably the toughest thing for me yeah good to know thanks for sharing that sure. now we got a segment called famous alumni from your prep school and i know you've been there less than a year so if you don't know these uh i'm not grading you but you'll know afterwards and i got yeah. these from the wikipedia page and here we go let's see, how, let's see how i do uh m emmett walsh do not know emmett walsh okay you'd know the face he's a character actor been in hollywood a long time he's been in movies such as blade runner Wild Wild West with Will Slapsmith and Twilight. Wow, well, I thought you were going to ask me athletes. We're going to go through graduates. This is uh, good. I need, I need to know this stuff. Athletes, that, we're going to get to them last because you got some okay. monsters that have been there, obviously, yeah. some big time players. But uh, yeah. these are just some random fun ones. So no, okay. no big deal. Charles Tinney, you're not going to know who Charles Tinney is, but at one point he was the top hat salesman in the world in the late 1800s. Wow, it's tremendous. Okay. Last one, non-athlete, John Perkins. He's an author, and his most famous book was Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Now, do you know Tilton? Mr. Tilton, where the school is named after, the town's named after? Tell me. The story that, that what I've been told is during the great during the gold rush, when everyone was moving west, instead of digging gold, he decided to make the picks and the, the, the sifters. And that's where he made all his money by following them and selling, selling those tools to them. So I know, I know where the name came from. I got that one for you. That's great business strategy right yes, there, right? Absolutely. Smart individual. All right. Let's talk about the obvious guys who are the NBA players. We've got Nerlens Noel, George Niang, and Wayne Selden. And those guys were all on the same team at the same time. And that's when Tilton won the national prep championship back in what? 12 2009, or 2009. 2009. Yeah. So 2009 national champions. They were a tremendous, tremendous group. They're the banners hang in the gym. Um, you know, that's something that would be very, very difficult to duplicate. That was this lightning in the bottle to have all those kids at one time. Obviously, they were BABC kids. Um, and there was a pipeline that came here to Tilton at that time. 
Uh, so yes, that was a great group. Yeah, Terrence Mann also went there. Well, it's funny you say that. Um, two weeks ago, I was walking into the gym and there was a big buzz when I walked into the weight room. Kids are saying, coach, can you believe it? Can you believe it? There's an NBA guy in the gym right now. I did not know. I did not know what they were talking about. We didn't have any NBA guys on our team this year. So I, I walked in the gym and Terrence Mann and Frank Porter, who both played together here at Tilton, Terrence had just lost to the Pelicans. And I guess he flew back to the Boston area to visit family and friends. And he was so fond of his four years experience here at Tilton headmaster. Nobody knew he was coming. He literally just showed up on campus. He walked in the gym and he was taking pictures in front of the trophies, in front of the banners. And I went over, I coached against him um, when I was at my past prep school. So I went over, said hello, talked to him. He actually went into a little barbershop in the center of town. And obviously he has cornrows. He wasn't getting a haircut, but the, the gentleman, Caleb, that owns a barbershop is a big fan. It comes to all the games. And Terrence walked into the barbershop, sat down for five minutes and talked to the owner of the barbershop about his career and playing here. That out of the blue, he appreciated this place so much that he came back to spend about an hour on campus to say thank you, some of his old teachers. That's a testament right there, isn't it? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That's the experience that he had here. And hopefully I'll be able to try to get it back to that level again and find guys of those abilities. Yeah. So that was this week's episode or, or portion of Famous Alumni from the three. prep school over three but guess what now you now you know and now i know about tilton so there you go. perfect there we go it's educational for everybody um we're going to talk about your former school here if you don't mind winchenden and you turn that into a national powerhouse like what's the prescription if i have if i'm a prep school headmaster and i want to turn a prep school into a national powerhouse what does that take well when i got to the winchenden school um the numbers were down um, Mr. LaBelle had just taken over the school and the school needed an it. It needed a selling point. Um, and luckily for me, uh, Mr. LaBelle uh, was an athlete at UMass Amherst. And when he was looking to hire a coach, Mr. LaBelle asked Coach Calipari who we should hire. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got the job at the Winchester School. And when we sat down and talked about the program and what I was trying to do, and what I thought the school could do, he wanted to win. Um, he was willing to make an investment in the program, whereas to spend money to make money, whereas to put financial aid into a program of families that were deserving of it, whereas uh, we lost some players that, you know, that the family could afford large tuition um, and they were high division one kids and we would never break a rule and go below that whereas obviously you fill out the financial aid forms and they tell you how much you can afford uh we we couldn't go around that but if a family was deserving the aid he was willing and he trusted me to bring the right kids on campus and once we started to do that and then luckily for me the international market i was able to bring in bruno shunda who was a 36 player pick during the nba draft during the lockout so Dallas couldn't bring him to Dallas. And he was a high school kid that didn't speak English. And we had a great ESL program. So Bruno and his countryman, Ivan Cartello, who ended up going to Notre Dame, transferred to uh, Purdue. They both came to the Winchester School. And the thing that it did is not only did we become a household name in the United States, but we became a household name internationally. And we started getting kids from Africa, Lithuania, Romania, uh, we got kids from uh, Turkey, we get kids from all over in Brazil. And I tried to find a good mix of domestic kids and international kids, because as you know, a lot of the times of these international kids, they're so appreciative of the opportunity to come to the United States. And some of the kids, domestic kids have been spoiled so much and been given everything they've wanted, that when I brought in that nucleus of kids, it was a great mix because they both helped each other and it was two styles of basketball. So they both helped each other. Uh, and due to that success we had and kids going to Louisville, Francisco Garcia, say Bruno going, Bruno played his last game against, North, uh, against Northfield Mount Hermon, 
flew to Dallas. His first three games, he played against Shaquille O'Neal, <laughs> Tim Duncan, and Elijah Wan was his first three games. So Nepsack's very good, but it's not NBA. <laughs> um, but the fact that Mr. LaBelle was willing to spend money to make money, the school went from 80 students to 200 students in a very short time period. Because of basketball. I mean, I'm being a little bit biased. It was during the ESL boom as well. So we brought in a lot of international students, the South Korean market, the Chinese market, the Japanese market. So that helped as well. And to go along with that, a lot of those international kids, especially Asian kids, love basketball. Obviously, you know, basketball is huge in China, but it's huge in Asia. They wanted to go to school with those kids. And they were in the same classroom with them. And I went out of my way to have two Asian managers every year because they appreciated being around those guys and it helped both sides. Um, so I can't say Mr. LaBelle would be mad at me if I said basketball is what did it. It's not what did it. It's his work ethic in the school. But that international market, that Asian market, the basketball program, I believe really took that school to new heights from the buildings where I got there to where the building, buildings that are there now and the reputation now. I think basketball and athletics had a lot to do with that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So it comes down to is an administration willing to fund a certain sport? And if they do fund it, it kind of, it kind of equals funding equals success. In the it's an investment. Way. It's an yeah. investment. You know what I mean? Like if you're going to pay for your child to go to school and it costs you 75 grand, is it worth it? Or should you just get right into the work world? Right. Are you willing to make the investment? That's what I tell families now when they want to decide if they should come to Tilton or not, or go or decide to go a different route. Are you willing? My family made an investment for me to go to Fork Union Military Academy. My, I swear it took my mother 50 years to pay it off because she reminded me every, every time I saw her, but is it wor- was it worth her investment? It was worth their investment because I got a full athletic scholarship. So as a headmaster, is it worth the investment of bringing those kids in? And again, you have to have a coach that's a disciplinarian that's going to make sure you look after the kids. You got to have, you know, coaches either in the dorms, a coach that the kids really, really respect. Because, you know, sometimes kids can challenge the coach, can challenge the authority figures. Uh, They have to say no and live live to the word no when they hear it. Um, but if you can find a headmaster in an administration that believes that spending money will in, in turn make you money, yes, it, it definitely can work. There's an old rap phrase, scared money don't make none. Absolutely. But it's a huge <laughs> investment. It's a huge investment for a headmaster and a board to be willing to do that. But again, there are a lot of cases out there. Look at Duke. When they hired Krzyzewski, I mean, Duke was obviously a great academic school. He got to didn't win right away. He started to win. Now it's a household name. And how many people apply to go to that school? Uh, I always give the, the analogy here in the New England area, Doug Flutie. When Doug Flutie had that ridiculous run and won the Heisman, it was the most applicants at Boston College has ever had because they had athletics, because they played at the highest level and played on TV, spend money to make money. It helped the school build new buildings. So I agree. If you can find administration that's steadfast and believes that, it can pay off if you have the right coach and the right setting for those kids to be successful. Yeah, and on that same line, when Top Gun came out in the 80s, that next year, the Naval Academy had more applications ever, right? So there is correlations. And you know what's going to happen now? St. Peter's, New Jersey, uh, after this little run in the tournament they had, they're going to go up. No, donors, kids are going to want to go to school there. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's, that's a perfect analogy. Um, Hargrave, was that before or after Winchenden? Before. I, I graduated in 90. My first job was Ferrum College, Division Three, Roanoke College, Division Three. Then I went to Hargrave Military Academy. There was an old timer there named Larry Matthews, who they just started the program. And he knew that I played for Fletcher Arrett at Fork Union. And Hargrave at that point wanted to be wanted to have the athletic program similar to Fork Union. So Larry brought me in for a year. I worked for him for a year. And then he retired. I, I took the program over right afterwards. Yes. Was that the same situation where they had the financial backing to turn that program around? Yes. Yes. They, they were they football as well. When I was there, um, they, they had the big time football as well because they, again, Hargrave, want, I don't, they won't like saying this, but they wanted to be similar to Fork Union. Yeah. Fork Union has been there forever. Hargrave was an up and start prep school. They've been there for, I mean, Larry Brown, 
played and went to Hargrave Military Academy, uh, but they wanted to be on the national scene. So they started basketball and they started football and that's what helped springboard them to such a successful program. Was that weird when you were coaching Hargrave playing against your alma mater in Fletcher? Tremendously weird. Um, and every summer, Coach Hart would always invite all his former players back. So I'd work their summer camp. Walking in the doors and having to play against someone that I idolized more than anyone else um, was a huge challenge. When I was at the Winchenden School, Coach Hart invited us to the Fork Union Invitational Tournament. And, you know, one of my biggest, you know, wins was beating Coach Arrett on that, on my, in lack of a better word, home floor. There's only one place in the world that my number could ever be retired or my jersey could ever be retired. But if you walk into alumni gymnasium um, at Fork Union, my number 33 at UMass is on, is on the wall. It's not going to be retired at UMass Amherst, but it's on, on the wall there. But, yes, competing against Coach Arrett, um, was an unbelievable thing for me because he's a reason why I got into coaching. When Cal Perry took over the job, myself and one of my teammates, Sean Nealon, I asked Coach Arrett if he could get us ready for the first day of school. So he brought us down to Fork Union, and for 10 days we lived in the barracks. He woke us up at 6 in the morning. We ran five, seven miles. Afternoon we did individual work. At night we did skill training in two, 220s and 440s. We did that for 10 days. He, he, he registers in a road race on the uh, in Virginia Beach, and on the ride to the road race, he looked at me and he would always call you by your last name, Burns. You're going to be a better coach than you were a player. And at that point, I thought I was a great player. I was going to play in Europe or be a pro, what have you. He says, "You are. I'll guarantee it." And I was like, "What are you talking about? You're going to be a great co coach someday." And I'm like, "No, you don't know what you're talking about." And that was obviously, I believe, my calling. And through him and the direction from my father, that's where and how I got into coaching because of him. Oh, thanks for sharing that. That's a great story. A sure. uh, couple quick hitters here near the end. What are your thoughts on the current NCA transfer rule, especially being a former transfer yourself? Right now, and I can understand it for certain reasons, when a coach leaves a program, I believe a kid should be able to leave a program if a new coach come, comes mm -hmm. in that he doesn't like. But now that they have that you can, you know, the, the transfer and play right away just makes it so easy for kids to transfer. Um, so I do understand the transfer portal because obviously it helped me find a better situation. And they're probably going to have to use smarter people than myself to be able to fix it. But it's, it's just, it's not right to have 1,500 kids in the transfer portal right now. And it's amazing. It, it, it trickles down to prep schools. Whereas there are kids that I'm talking to that I believe need prep schools. They need Coach Burns. They need Tilton. And when I talk to their families on the phone, they say, well, Coach, we have some college programs that are telling us to wait and to hold on because they're involved with some transfers. But if they don't get them, they'll have a scholarship for my son, which 99% of the chance that is not true. But again, those college coaches, we get back to the question, Division One coaches, what are they willing to say? They'll say that to kids and kids want to hear that they want to have hope. So they hear it and then they wait. And then unfortunately they may miss out on a great opportunity at a prep school that they belong because we all have to fill our rosters. Right. So it misses out. So I don't know exactly how to fix the transfer, you know, the transfer rule. As I said, the one with college coaches switching, I understand that. Um, kids should have to sit out. There should be something holding them against it. Right now you have these college programs that new coaches get the job and they're assassins. They're now out there trying to get these transfers to be able to win right away. So the idea of getting young kids and nurturing a program and having kids be there for four years and that, you know, that, that, that process we talked about, the journey, they're not having that now because kids are jumping in and now taking over those minutes and these college programs and these presidents expect them to win right away, that they don't give them all that four years to bring in their own guys, nurture them through. They want to win right away. So you got to go out and take these transfers, roll the dice, and hope they fix, fit together, which kids usually don't. Um, so it has to be fixed. I wish I had all the answers, um, but it doesn't really make sense. Yeah. You know, I think it all comes down to a three-year contract for a coach. They got to win right away to where if they had a five or six year and the school had patience, then it could get four-year kids and build a culture. And I'm real curious, Mike, to see 
you know, these coaches now that are doing transfers and kind of seeing over the past two years how it's gone, will they continue to go that route? Or they just start saying, you know what, we tried it. We might take one or two, but we're going to start developing culture guys and four-year guys, you know, like Jones over at Yale. I don't think he's had a transfer in his entire time there. And if I'm him, I'm putting that on a billboard outside every AAU tournament saying, this is a right, good culture place. You're not going to want to leave because we're going to take care of you. We're going to do things the right way. So I'm real curious to see how this ends up panning out. When you talked about the hiring process of giving them three years, giving them five years, if you're a president and athletic director and you make a decision to hire somebody, you have to make sure you do your homework and hire that right person. And you give them that contract. Well, you're going to make sure you're hiring the right guy. Uh, and when you hire that guy, are you hiring a guy that wants to bring in, that you that you want to bring in seven transfers right away? In all likelihood, if they're transferring, they're not happy for one reason or the other where they were, and they're trying to find a better situation. I'm curious to be a fly on the wall when you're recruiting all these transfers because these kids are transferring because they want to be guaranteed minutes, they want to be guaranteed shots, and they want to be guaranteed they're going to be a pro. Like our division one coaches telling these kids that they're having those three things. And once they tell them those three things and they get there and they don't get it, they have to be disgruntled. So how do they keep them happy? And how do they keep the whole team happy? And if there are seven kids, you've told that not all seven can play. How can you have any cohesion amongst that group? It'd be better just to be honest and then just get the kids to buy in. Right. That's Again, what you do. That's what I try. I mean, that's what I try to do. Kids, kids don't really like it, but that's what I try to do. So they can't say later on down the line, coach, you lied to me and you made promises you didn't right. fulfill. I tell them you're a division two player. Well, no, I'm a division one player. I said, if you're a division one player, you're going to help me win more games. Make me feel bad. And I'll apologize. Yeah. If that motivates you great. Cause if you're better than I'm saying you are, we're going to win more games. I'm going to be a happier person. So that's the motive. And that's the way I try to go about it. Well, my theory is if any, even if a prep school coach or college coach promises you minutes, run, because they shouldn't be able to do that. All that should be determined on day one of practice after open gyms happened and the guys that earn it, get it. That's my theory, just like yours. It just so when I hear I, promise minutes, it's just like, ugh. Quick story. My, so my junior year, Cal Perry had to play me because he hadn't really brought his whole recruiting class in. So my junior year, I actually played probably 19, 21 minutes a game. My senior year, first practice, I was a starting athletic wing, which I'm not athletic. Tony Barbie, Cal recruited Tony Barbie to come in. By the end of that first practice, Mike Burns was no longer the starting wing because I wasn't as good as Tony Barbie. And I understood that. So when you make promises to these kids, it's not fair to them because how can you look them in the eyes and lie to them and say, you're going to get minutes. You're going to start. You're going to be a pro. Cause as I said before, they're going to be disgruntled. And if they're disgruntled, I mean, even give you the example what happened with kid Wong down in Miami with this new NIL thing. So they bring in other kids because they want to win and they have a millionaire willing to put the money out. So now you have a kid on the team who's probably the best player on the team. He finds out that a transfer is coming in, is getting more money than he is. He's not happy. I want to leave where I want to make more money. And it just doesn't make any sense the state of you know college athletics right now and how people can say that's right. What values are we actually teaching those kids? Yeah. I think most kids though, across the board, Mike, want a meritocracy where the best players in practice earn the playing time. And that could change throughout the season. And as a coach, you have to be willing to make the change. If you're the type of coach that says, I'm going to play the guys that play the hardest and produce the most in practice. If you don't live by that in the next game, either start change your starting lineup or give those kids opportunities. For me here, I'm going to bring in 13 new kids. I have one returning kid. So I'm bringing in 13 new kids. So if I pick five, and then don't reward the second five that beat them one day. Well, why would that second five come to practice right. to challenge those top fives? We're not getting better as a team, and they're not learning any values in life. In life, you have to be rewarded for hard work. If you're not rewarded for hard work, they're not going to work hard. Of all your years of coaching, what's one player that's come in and really took advantage of the, the prep school year, either post-grad or, or being there more than one year, and really surprised you to be the biggest uh, growth that one of your players has had during their time with you? Or maybe a kid, you just like, yeah, we'll take him. And then, whoa, he, he really surprised you. Wow. 
There's a lot of them, I know. Wow. Um, man, I don't want to have a dead answer. I just get the most out of his get the most out of his opportunity. Um, a, a lot of the thing I like to say with the international kids, just because they had an opportunity to come over to America. I had a kid named Luis Leal from Brazil, six five, big strong kid, couldn't speak one word of English when he got on campus. I had, had him in the classroom as well. Um, learned English. Would, would work for faculty members on weekend, rake in their lawns to come up, to come up with money to be able to send money back home to his family. Then he had a blood disorder. He took a charge against South Kent and had a pain in his hip, went to the doctors, had it looked at, had this blood disorder, uh, had to sit out a year, came back from the blood disorder. Captain, I couldn't get division one schools to recruit him. He ended up going to Mercyhurst was an academic athletic All-American. And now he lives in Raleigh with his wife, volleyball player that he met at Mercy Earth. And he's now an anesthesiologist uh, in Raleigh. And luckily for me, my oldest daughter goes to NC State. So he has her over for dinners from time to time. But you talk about a kid that had an opportunity that could not speak one word of English. When he left the Winchester School, he was a 4.0 student. He ended up being an academic All-American, and now he's an anesthesiologist. And when we talk about it, it all goes in a circle. I put on Facebook that my daughter's decided to study biomedical engineering at NC State. I didn't even know Luis was in Durham. He contacts me the day I move her in. He's standing out in the parking lot, help me move her in. And over holidays, she can't go home. He goes over and spends time with her family. So I don't know if that really directly answered your question athletically wise, but as far as life wise and taking advantage of that opportunity, if he didn't have the opportunity. And since that time, he had to take a loan to be able to go to grad school. His family had to sell one of their sell their house so he could go. He has now bought his family an apartment in Brazil and he always gives back. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's it's not always about going to D1. It's about what kind of change a kid's gonna make. And that's kind of the thing. I mean, I'm tooting my own horn here and tooting the prep school world's horn but it's about more than just basketball too and you just mentioned a bunch of other things that the right kid if they take advantage of it full-heartedly it can change their life and he was a division one player like they they made mistakes because he was six five and not a great athlete they didn't measure the size of the kid's heart there's no question that's why he's all american obviously at mercy Earth. um but yes he, and he always says thank you now he's like, Coach Burns, is there any way that I can start a scholarship? Can I bring a Brazilian kid over and can I sponsor him to play for you because I want to give back? Because someone helped get me out of Brazil and gave me this opportunity. I want to do the same thing for somebody else. That's just, that to me is, and there are very few Luis Leos now, uh, but he was somebody that definitely took advantage of the opportunity that he had. Oh, that's great. Thanks for sharing that one. We're going to do a lightning round here, Mike. Uh, my first question is biggest win of your career, and I'm assuming that's going to be your win at Fork Union, which you already mentioned. Well, I mean, I beat Calipari when I was at um, – Oh, right. You know, when I beat him in the NIT. I know your dad probably doesn't like that being a big Kentucky fan. Uh, but, again, just that shaking his hand afterwards – uh, and I've been told that I'm the only former, former player that has ever beaten Cal Perry. Now, again, I was in a, I was an assistant coach. Um, so maybe that doesn't really count, but yes, beating coach Arrett at Fork Union to win the uh, Fork Union Invitational Tournament was probably one of, one of the biggest just for beating my mentor. Okay, great. Who's the best player you've ever coached against either at the prep level or the college level or both? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I coached in the United Center for the Sonny, Sonny Vaccaro round ball. I had Dwight Howard on my team. who was the number one player I picked in the draft. Uh, Drummond was, you know, pretty, pretty good when he was uh, with, with, with St. Thomas Moore. But again, all, all those ABCD, I mean, LeBron James, uh, all those guys in, in summer camp, work at ABCD camp, coach against those guys. But as far as the net sack, it would probably be, against Drummond, Darrell Wright, but probably Drummond as far as NEPSAC goes. But ABCD can't be coached against everyone you watch on TV night in, night out. Yeah. What are your hobbies when you're not coaching? My family. I'm a girl dad. So my family would definitely be one. Um, 
I, I have a tough time sitting still, so I have to keep myself moving. Believe it or not, fishing is the only thing that I really can keep myself sit still. I go down to the uh, water in uh, Rhode Island, try to chase the striped bass up and down the, the eastern seaboard. Probably, probably my biggest hobby, I would say. Okay, that sounds like fun. And uh, lastly, what's your favorite movie of all time? We were driving in a charter bus. We're playing the Hall of Fame Classic. We were driving to play Lomberg with Chris Cheney. They were undefeated. And on the bus ride, on a charter bus, because obviously we drove in little vans because it's a Hall of Fame game, they sent us a charter bus, put on Sparta 300. By the time we got to the floor, my guys were completely out of their minds, ready to attack. And we, we, we beat them. Probably it was a hell of a, hell of a basketball game. Uh, but probably Sparta 300 just because of that, that, uh, that whole experience of the ride and the pregame talk, writing it up on the wall. And the phalanx, how you have to hold the phalanx, that they were so much more talented than we were. But if the phalanx all together to protect as a team, uh, I would probably say Sparta 300. Awesome. Where can people find you, Mike, on social media and then the internet? Um, internet, I'm on Twitter at mburnsy33. Um, obviously, um, Instagram, same, same exact type of way. Uh, you can go on our school's website to find my email address, mburnstiltonschool.org. Um, please send me any messages, any questions, any concerns, any recommendation to kids you think that could help Coach Burns or, or more importantly, that maybe they need Coach Burns. I couldn't tell you how many times that I've had a college coach call me and say, Coach Burns, I think this kid needs you more than you need him. Meaning kids that just need that structure and that discipline in their lives. Um, I still have the same energy I had when I was 25 years old at my age now. Um, I still bring it every day. I challenge any coach to bring it the way I do every day, but I'm passionate about what I do. And if there are kids out there that want that challenge and want to get better, uh, I'm definitely up for the challenge. Well, perfect. Well, Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, on this episode here, uh, we had Coach Mike Burns of the Tilton School share his uh, career with us and his thoughts. If you like what you hear on this, be sure to subscribe to the Prep Athletics Podcast on all the major podcasting platforms. Also, subscribe on YouTube. You can make sure to uh, you know get the bonus footage there. If you have any questions, you can find me at prepathletics.com. Uh, emails on there, phones on there. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. So with that being said, I want to thank Coach Burns for being on the podcast today. Corey, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate all your help. You're tremendous in what you do. I mean that. When I was looking for prep schools, there wasn't a Corey out there. You've helped so many families and you've helped me even with the recruiting when families contact you and you feel comfortable with Coach Burns and the Tilton School and you refer him to us. I really do appreciate you doing a lot for those families and those kids. It's mutual. I appreciate what you do to my clients. I send your way and just for the game and what you've done. So thanks for sharing this today, Mike. And we will see you guys next time on the Prep Athletics Podcast.